Welcome everybody, thanks for joining us this morning, uh, this rather dreary morning. Um, before I hand over to James, just a bit of housekeeping. If you would like to ask a question at any point, please just pop it into the chat. I'll be monitoring that um, as we go through the, the session and, um, and then we can sort of have a question and answer session right at the end. So um, moving on to introduce James, he's a partner and head of business services at Wolfson Solicitors. He's, um, he heads up uh, business services department. He's an employment law and education specialist who acts for both employers and employees. So he's seen it from both sides of the fence in all aspects of um, employment law. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over to you, James. And like I say, please chip in with questions as we go along. Thanks, Faye. Um, and yeah, so th thank you for inviting me and for you and Elle from Astley for organising today and pulling it all together. As Faye has said, um, if you have got any questions, please do post those in the chat box and um, Faye can then ask me those as we go through. And we can also have a mop up session at the end where you can ask me anything you like to do with employment or HR, and hopefully I'll know the answer. Um, or, or you can say, focus on topics of the day or just a general query, that's absolutely fine. As Faye says, I'm from Wolfston Solicitors. Um, hopefully you've heard of us. And today I'm going to talk to you about staffing issues um, post returning from lockdown. So I expect some of you will still have staff on furlough leave, or you may get staff that are uh, going to start thinking differently when children go back and when the world starts to return to normal as we forest, uh, follow Boris's um, roadmap. So the, the first issue I'm going to talk to you about is reluctant returners. So these are individuals who are saying, I don't want to come back to work after furlough leave. And these generally fall into three camps. But I feel unsafe. Um, I live with someone who is vulnerable and therefore I don't want to risk contracting the virus and then infecting them so I don't want to come into work and um, I have childcare responsibilities. Although um, thankfully that, that last one for most of us, um, that, that should hopefully disappear from the 8th of March. Um, I know many of us are counting down the days. So uh, the children all go back. We no longer have <laughs> raising a fist. Um, yeah, um, so, so that one's probably going to disappear. Um, but I will cover it briefly just in case there are people that are saying, because um, you might get a situation where parents are saying, um, I don't want my child to go back to school. I think that's unsafe and therefore I've got childcare responsibilities. Or you might have an outbreak in a school um, where then the children are sent home um, from within their particular. If, if, if that's the issue, you've got a member of staff who's absent due to childcare responsibilities, then you would deal with that in the same way you would ordinarily absent the pandemic. That's the starting point. So do you have some sort of policy which allows for a certain number of days dependents leave where you say, OK, for six children, we allow the first five days pay? Um, if not, then it's up to you. You can either exercise your discretion, say, um, this is a particularly unusual situation and we're going to allow a certain number of days paid or unpaid but not counting towards your absence record or you can go for a more sort of um, aggressive stance and start counting that as absence and if, if, if employees are absent then you can start managing them through your absence management procedures, setting targets, issuing warnings and warning them that ultimately, if they don't uh, improve their attendance, then you may have to terminate their employment, having gone through a full and fair procedure. Of course. The other um, two are, are, are similar. It's um, that's I feel unsafe when I live with someone who is vulnerable. The I live with someone that's vulnerable, there's a lot of um, myth about this. The government has never said if you live with someone that's clinically vulnerable, you should not go to work over and above when they said everyone should um, not go to work. So living with someone who's clinically extremely vulnerable and is therefore shielding does not mean that you um, that not that an employee does not need to go to work. That person is in the same category as someone that's saying, I just, I'm not, I don't feel safe. I don't want to come to work. And um, the starting point, how you deal with uh, reluctant returners the first thing is, you, 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 and this is for everyone, this is whether you've got reluctant returners or not. 
these are the general safety requirements and standards that you should be implementing at your organization and if you do this hopefully you won't get reluctant returners. so the first one is obvious is your workplace covid secure obviously you can never guarantee that your workplace is 100 percent covid secure. or have you done everything that's reasonably practical have you um, implemented social distancing? Have you got systems in place for using the kitchen, walkways, that sort of thing? Hopefully we're all pretty used to this, um, having lived with this pandemic for, for a year now, but it re is really important, especially if you, um, some organisations won't have gone back at all, will have been home working the whole time, waiting until the announcement on the 21st of June and then looking at the 26th of June, um, then they, they really do need to put some effort into making the workplace COVID secure. You need to have an updated risk assessment. Yeah, you need to complete a COVID risk assessment at your workplace. That's a requirement from the HSE, and you need to update that. You need to consult with your staff over your risk assessment. It's all well and good having a risk assessment, um, but again, the HSE says you should consult your staff about that. So that's a case of emailing that to all staff, uh, perhaps setting up a virtual meeting where you invite feedback, listen to what people say, listen to any concerns they have, and then amending that risk assessment if necessary. And then you've got to publish your risk assessment after that consultation. Ideally, you'll display it on uh, your website or an internal intranet, and you'll also email it to everyone so that you can prove that you've given everyone a copy of your risk assessment so they should be aware of the um, safety measures that you've put in place, it is as COVID secure as possible. Having done all of that, if you then get individuals that are saying, I'm still concerned, I don't want to come into work, then you've got to decide how you're going to handle um, that situation. The key, of course, is consultation. You need to send the, the, the risk assessment and any other documents to them on an individual basis. You need to load them up with your evidence to show that your workplace is COVID secure. Then invite them to an individual virtual consultation meeting. Yeah, this isn't a general meeting or a group meeting like you'd have with the risk assessments. This is an individual one-on-one -on -one meeting with the reluctant returner where they should not feel embarrassed to tell you about their concerns, where they can air their concerns, where they can tell you the specific, what it is that they are concerned about. And it's really important that you drill down on the specifics, because if people say things like, I just feel unsafe, then you need to be pushing back a little bit and say, okay, well, talk to me about that. What, what, what aspect of the workplace is it that you feel is unsafe? For example, we've got this social distancing, We've got these measures in place for our kitchen arrangements. But to talk to them about specifics, listen to what they've got to say, and then try and counter them. Listen to their concerns. And then and the, the other part is to consider additional measures. So, for example, at Wolfstons, we've had um, some employees that are more vulnerable than others or just reluctant to return. We, we've done things like um, this won't be practical for all organisations, but you can arrange things so that individuals have their own toilets or they have their own access to a, a particular photocopier that won't be touched by other people, that they're moved to a different workspace so they're not interacting with as many people or there's not as many people walking past them. So any sort of additional measures that you can then put in place for that reluctant returner to reassure them, anything like that's really going to help to respond to their concerns. I advise doing that in writing. So after you've sent them all of your documents, you've met with them, you've listened to their concerns, you've responded to their concerns, you've put in place any additional measures that you can, you then put that in writing. So then you've got your record of that, something that can be relied upon further down the line if necessary. When I say in writing, email's fine, but you want some sort of documented record of you had and any measures that you've introduced. If you need a further meeting after that, have one. If the employee is still pushing back on specifics and saying, well, actually, there's just this one area that I feel unsafe on, then have another meeting. After you've gone through all of those steps, so you've consulted individually with someone, you're then getting to sort of push comes to shove. What are we going to do with these individuals that are reluctant to return? My advice is you 
right there. You've got to grab the bull by the horns. You don't want the employees dictating what happens here, which is what I have seen um, in a couple of organizations before they've come to us. It's employees saying, I'm not coming in. I'm only coming in if X, Y, and Z. It isn't the way it should be. If you've placed uh, these COVID secure measures and consulted with them on over their concerns. Your first option is to continue the current arrangements. We're expecting the, the Chancellor to announce today the extension of the furlough scheme until September. So one option is to continue to furlough individuals. Um, or if individuals aren't furloughed, you may just continue to pay them. Not an option many employers are going to want to take and not something that I'm recommending that you do, but it is uh, an option available to you. Second option is to consider varying their working arrangements. Can you somehow facilitate so that they do some home working and some in the office? Can they be moved to different tasks that will involve uh, less social interaction? It won't be possible in all situations, but these are all um, options for you to consider. The third option, and again, not something I'm recommending, is that you threaten to, to dismiss if, if, if the individual fails to return. This is a possibility. Uh, it, it, may be a fair, it may be a fair dismissal. As you can probably understand, we don't have any case law on this point. And even if we did have case law, I think it's going to be so fact specific. specific. I think you, will, you may be able to justify dismissal if um, an individual was a really key cog in your organisation and you couldn't function without them and they were saying, I'm not coming to work and you needed that individual uh, to come to work and you'd gone through all the steps that I'd advised on, then you may be able to justify dismissal but it is high risk. What most employers are doing in these situations, and what we've been advising employers to do, is, is, is to withhold pay. If you've gone through all of those steps, you've met with the employee, you've addressed their concerns, you've shared your risk assessment, you've put in extra measures, and the employee is still saying, look, I don't feel safe, I don't want to come to work, then one option for you to say is, okay, we're happy with that, but we're not going to pay you, because you're not, you're not available for work, We've got work to offer you, but you're not willing to do it. So therefore, we're not going to pay you. Again, we have no case law on that specific point, but um, that is a, a, a much lower risk option. And going back to grabbing the bull by the horns, this is what most employers are doing when faced with that situation. Because they don't want employees saying, I'm not coming in, because it can set a precedent. What happens if the rest of the workforce then does that? Um, your whole business could fall away. So having gone through all those earlier steps, saying that if an employee doesn't attempt work, that you're going to withhold their pay is a fairly sensible option. Are there any questions, Bay, at this stage in terms of reluctant returners before I move on? To my yeah, section? yeah, we've ha we've had a couple. I mean, um, one business has sort of said that obviously cash is quite limited with a, an SME. So um, in terms of the reason what is a reasonable adjustment because clearly not everyone has the luxury of being able to offer you know personalized <laughs> printers and scanners or yeah. you know so um and, and how to what extent you have to evidence the the reasonableness of the measures that you are putting into place and is there any yeah. kind of like standard what's reasonable what's not per size of business or something like that i suppose yeah, well, I'm going to give you a typical sort of lawyer's grey answer here, which is that it really does depend on the circumstances. It really does depend on your organisation because no two organisations are going to be the same. And you're quite right. You, you, not all organisations are going to be able to afford an expensive photocopier or have a spare room. And you're certainly not going to be expected to go and build an additional room or um, purchase an additional photocopier, depending upon your budget. If you're a sort of multi-million pound organisation, and you've got a spare room, then why not buy a photocopier, put it in that room for that person to use? If you're a small SME, um, then it, it's not going to be appropriate or reasonable for you to um, make expensive outlays. It really is a case-by-case -case basis. But what I will say, if you want to discuss an individual situation like that with me um, following the meeting, you will have my email address. Contact me. And we can talk through those specifics one on one, um, in particular to your organisation and that situation and give you a view. I think that's probably the best way to handle that. OK, and there was one other question about um, sometimes the things that staff members worry about are outside of the control of the actual employer. You know, things like if they have to travel by public transport or um, 
yeah, exposure on their way to work or um, things out, outside of the work environment. So presume, you know, is the employer just responsible for once they step across the threshold? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, I'm sure we are going to see some case law on this at some point, because uh, it, again, it's a really difficult area. As the employer, you're requiring the employee to attend work. And if they don't drive, or they don't have a car, then you know what I mean? you're, you're asking them to use public transport, aren't you? Um, the government has said public transport is safe. The, the, the government says use public transport with a mask. So that's, that's the best we can give on that, is that if the government are recommending that you do use public transport and they have implemented um, social distancing measures on trains and things, buses, then the, the, the argument is that, that those methods of transport are safe. Obviously, you still want to consult with employees. You want to talk to them, try and educate them about why you say it's safe, what measures the bus companies or the train operators have put in place, have a look at their COVID risk assessments, which should be published, talk to the employees about those, and go back to whether you can adjust their duties. Um, is it possible that you could allow them to finish earlier so that they could get a bus, have less people on it that's not a bus each time, for example? Could you adjust their duties so that they're working one day a week from home so it limits the number of occasions they have to use public transport? Again, it comes down to individual situation, and I can um, talk to anyone that has a okay. problem. We're talking generally, it comes down to consultation and trying to uh, uh, reduce the concerns of the employee. Okay, I think that's it for now. So, okay, back on. <laughs> thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll carry on with the second section, which is anti vaxxers, um, which again is it's going to be an interesting area. Uh, lots of unknowns, lots of grey areas at the moment. So, I'm just clicking through my slides, being a bit slow. So, yeah. Um, ACAS actually issued some guidance on the 25th of February. I'd like to say I was organised enough so that I prepared my slides prior to that date and I had to rewrite them, but that's, that's not true. Um, uh, it was actually the day I, I, I first started looking at it, um, the, the ACAS guidance, they published um, what you can see on your screens now. I won't read it out, I'll just give you a 30-second um, read and digest that. Okay, hopefully we've all had time to digest that. Now, I found this particularly unhelpful, if I'm honest. Um, the, 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 um, the, the starting point, ACAS advice is that it is best to support staff to get the vaccine without making it a requirement. And I think that's the key here. It is going to be incredibly difficult to require staff to take uh, or have the vaccine. I've, high, I've underlined two key points in that statement. Uh, they say, uh, if an employer feels that a vaccination is a necessary requirement for someone to do their job, yeah? So that's a really key bit. It's only if it's a necessary requirement. But even then, what they're saying is, even if, where there is a necessary requirement, they're looking to agree it. They're not saying that you can require an employee to do it. They're saying, if it's necessary for them to have the vaccine, you look to agree that they have the vaccine. It's all sort of fairly unhelpful, I find. It's, just, it's again, going back to general employment law principles, trying to uh, encourage you to consult with your staff and reach agreement rather than impose things upon them. And dealing with necessary requirement, what I've done here is I've listed um, the instances where the government have recommended that you, you have the vaccine. And if you look at those, some of them don't necessarily apply um, to a, a workplace in terms of making it a necessary requirement for a job aged over 65. That's going to be an individual basis rather than a necessary requirement. So I've picked out the next slide where maybe necessary requirement. And these are all in the health sector. So if you're in the health sector, you, you and, and dealing with individuals, you may be in a slightly different category 
to, to, to those that are working in offices and other establishments. I think you've got a much better argument for justifying that it was a necessary requirement to impose upon someone that they have to have the vaccine be working in the care sector uh, than any other. Working in any other sector is going to be really difficult. So, if you are working in the care sector, uh, the first step is going to be to consult um, the, the whole group of the workforce, tell them what it is you're proposing to do, uh, talk through the risk assessments again, and then you're going to, it is following the same steps we were talking about reluctant concerners, you're going to invite individuals to a virtual consultation meeting and talk to them about why they don't want to have the vaccine, even if they are, though they are working care industry the government is recommending it and they could be a risk to vulnerable individuals not to listen to their concerns and then consider alternatives and educate what we do know about the vaccines which if the truth be told is not a lot at this stage you, you, it really is quite a tough spot to be in um, then you're going to respond to those concerns from an individual that's um, using or not wanting to have the vaccine and consider a further meeting The truth is, it, it, it is it's going to be really high risk if you're going to start trying to require individuals to have the vaccine, particularly at the moment, because the, the vaccine isn't readily available. It's only available for certain categories of uh, individual, so it's going to be even more difficult. But even when we get to a stage where the vaccine is available for everyone that wants it, and you've got individuals saying, I'm not having it, I don't want to have the vaccine, it's going to be high risk. Your options, uh, continue the current arrangements and agree um, to, to, that they can carry on and they can be paid either at home um, or uh, uh, the, the furlough option is obviously going to be available um, until September. Um, you can vary the working arrangements again, um, similar to the other slides that we've seen. If you've got an, a particular individual that's refusing to have the vaccine, then can they work from home? Can you rearrange their duties so that they're not coming into contact with other individuals at the workplace? But realistically, you can't do that forever. This is, a, this is the big problem here. Um, the, the COVID and these type of virus, viruses are not going to go away. Um, I certainly don't think they are. I think we're going to be living with um, vaccines. So you, you, it's very difficult to implement these type of measures for the long term by continuing to pay people or home working where that doesn't or um, lends to the job that employees are employed to do. You can threaten to dismiss if they fail to at um, attend work or have the vaccine. Um, again, extremely high risk um, to say so to an employee, if you don't have the vaccine, I'm going to dismiss you. Or you can explain that pay will be withheld if you don't have the vaccine. Again, high risk, much higher risk than the reluctant returners here. You, I, again, I can envisage a situation where you may be able to justify dismissal if you had all um, of the rest of the workforce knew that one individual was refusing to have the vaccine and the rest of your workforce was saying, we don't feel safe, we're not coming into work unless Joe Bloggs has the vaccine. Then that's the, the type of limited situation where you may be able to justify dismissal. Um, but if, if it's a general feeling or one or two people complaining, then I think it's going to be very difficult. And the reason it's difficult is because of the risks. Um, the, the vaccine itself is a risk to certain individuals. There are certain individuals with particular health conditions, which mean they cannot have the vaccine, or if they have the, the vaccine, it exposes them to a risk. You can't expect those individuals um, to be forced by their employer to have a vaccine. There's going to be discrimination angles to this. You're going to have um, the elderly, the vulnerable, the disabled. Uh, there may be differences on um, based on race. Um, we, we saw sort of um, particular categories of uh, individual being more vulnerable to the virus. They may be more vulnerable to the vaccine. We don't know yet, but it's a really a sticky area, not one that I'm recommending that you um, get into. There's the unknown impact of the vaccine. Um, the, the vaccine's gone through testing, etc. But the, the, the truth is, we don't know the long term implications of it. So, again, it's going to be very difficult to justify vaccination. The other point is if, if you've got one individual in the workforce having, that, that hasn't had the vaccine, if everyone else has had the vaccine, then 
technically they shouldn't be able to contract the virus. Do you see what I mean? It's a bit of a circular argument, that one, but another factor to bear in mind. Um, there's the reputational damage to your organisation. I can see it, you know what I mean? It's the kind of thing that Daily Mail would love, um, that um, if, uh, the, an employer is sort of forcing their employees to have the vaccine. Um, so you've got to think about that as well, that reputation customers in terms of recruitment it, it could be damaging your business to have some sort of policy where you're trying to force vaccine upon individuals the unknowns at the moment and then there's human rights issues um this gets very complicated but should i mean the, 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 your human body is your own and it's a bit much for an employer to be forcing you to do something um with all of the names so the the messages on uh, vaccines it's it's a complicated area i think you're going to see all sorts of case law on it going forward but outside of the care sector i would stay well away from trying to require your employees to uh, have the vaccine now when i say trying to require them you can of course encourage um it's it's forcing have the vaccine or saying oh, i'm going to dismiss you unless you have it or i'm going to withhold pay unless you have it that i'm advising them against the alternatives consult with everyone make sure you talk to your workforce it may be that if you get everyone in a room uh, virtually probably at the moment and everyone starts talking about it that you may be able to persuade individuals that were originally against it that they may be able to um, they may be willing to accept the vaccine it's there's almost a duty on the employer to educate on the advantages and disadvantages so that people can make an informed decision. I think you're going to be in a much better place um, if you do have one of those sticky situations where everyone's saying, unless you dismiss so-and-so or force them to have the vaccine, I'm going. If you've educated on the advantages and disadvantages, you've explained to people, they can make an informed decision. And that information is changing. And so as an employer, there's a, a, arguably you need to be up to date on this. You need to be following the progress and what's reported in the press, reliable sources, of course, so that you can then pass that on to, to, to your employees and try and encourage them. That's what I think it's going to be about at this stage. It's going to be about encouraging employees to have the vaccine. Um, as discussed with all of the options, to, 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 sorry, all the topics today, if individuals can work from home, then, then that should be encouraged particularly as um, there, there are lots of unknowns at the moment. So the temporary changes of duties, again, these are all short-term measures um, rather than the long-term when the vaccine is readily available to all of us. Regular testing, that's another option for employers. Um, you're, you're, it's going to be far easier for an employer to justify I'm forcing my employees to have a test than I'm forcing them to have the vaccine. We've already seen the lateral flow testing regularly in schools requirements. Um, I, I, I think that is going to be something that you would be able to justify. Um, it's it's test, regular testing at work. And it's going to be, if an employee refuses to have a test, I think that's when you can. Again, you'd have gone through all the steps we've talked about previously consultation, education, um, countering individual objections. If you were to dismiss at the end of that, having gone through all of those steps, I think that dismissal is going to be capable of just that is likely to be a fair dismissal. So regular testing is something that um, can and may be implemented um, going forward. The sort of side issues for vaccinations are GDPR, um, uh, a very dull topic, one I tend to stay away from if possible, but it is worth um, mentioning a couple of things. First is, the first question is, can employers keep a record of which employers have been vaccinated? Again, typical lawyer's answer, grey, uh, possibly. Um, if you are going to keep a record of who's been vaccinated, then you need to identify your lawful basis for processing. Is it a necessary requirement for the job? Uh, for the performance of the job? Is it for the health and safety of individuals? Then when you've identified the lawful basis for that process, so you need to update your privacy notice. Um, if you're going to keep a record, the privacy notice is not just going to be the lawful basis, you're going to be talking about why you're, you're holding that information, where it's going to be held, what you're going to do with it, the actual purposes. And then think about the retention period, which is a really difficult um, one to answer at this stage. How long are you going to hold records of vaccinations for? Um, now, I think the 
you'd have to say um, something particularly vague, um, like this under review, but for no longer than is necessary. And you, you, you're probably going to be able to get away with that at the moment, with this climate of uncertainty. But going forward, you're going to have to have a more defined period. Uh, as, as with all things GDPR, uh, it, it can seem a bit scary and there's lots of bad press about it um, and, and sort of scare stories in the press. But I've been involved in lots of situations where employers have been reported to the ITO for alleged breaches. And the reality is it's very rare for employees to get fines. We've seen the likes of dating data and um, telesales um, organisations that are targeting individuals with cold being fined. But if you've made a mistake, if you've tried to do things properly and you haven't quite updated your privacy notice or you've made a mistake, you are highly unlikely to get a fine from the ICO. The other question, um, do employees have the right to be notified if they just to be vaccinated? Um, and the ICO advice, this is the first bit, this is to do with staff that contracted the virus. So um, not, not to do the vaccine, but if you look on the ICO, the I Information Commissioner's Office, what they say about um, employees that are contracted the virus is that you can tell your work for, your, for one of your colleagues the virus, but you shouldn't necessarily identify that individual. So you're keeping the individual's personal data out of it, but you are sharing that someone has contracted the virus. Reality that might make it quite obvious who it is when it comes to the virus because they're going to be away from work for a few weeks. And if they're the only individual that are that way, you, employees will be able to work it out. But that is official guidance from the Information Commission's office on that point. So, um, turning to whether um, employees who have refused the vaccination, the guidance is only if you have legitimate and compelling reasons. And again, I think that's going to be really difficult. Um, if you're in the care industry, again, you, you, you may be able to. If you've got individuals that are clinically extremely vulnerable, you're going to be faced with a situation of um, potentially exposing those, those individuals to an individual that's not have the virus. Again, it's going to be a case by case basis. And if you've got any of those types of situations, then you can contact me and we can talk those through on an individual basis. My advice at this stage is to, if, if indeed you are keeping records of who's having have the vaccine, is to um, go for the same as what the ICO says with someone with the virus. Uh, you can say there are people in this organisation that are refusing to have the vaccine, but I wouldn't go as far as um, naming the individuals. Then you're going to be in, in, in hot water. But... Um, down to all of that, you also have a duty to keep your, your, your staff safe. So you, you really are between a rock and a hard place. If you've got someone that's clinically extremely vulnerable on one hand, and then on the other, someone that's refusing to um, have the vaccine. And we'll, we'll have to see how this all plays out. It's very early days. The vaccine isn't readily available for, for everyone yet. And we may get some guidance from the government once the vaccine is readily available for everyone, because I think at that stage, it puts it into a situation where it is now, where um, you, you, you can't get it if you want it unless you meet certain criteria. Um, yeah, that's it from me on those two topics in terms of the signs. So it's just whether um, we've got any more questions either. Yeah, I've, I've had a few questions come in, so I'll, I'll uh, sort of raise those now. Does, uh, do you have any idea about the cost of routine testing and also whether that cost should be borne by the employee or the employer? I, I, I don't have any idea about the cost. I haven't looked at that at all. Um, I think it's going to be difficult to, look, to put that cost onto the employee because it's the health and safety matter. It's the same as providing health and safety equipment. So um, my hint is that the employer should be put that if they are going to um, testing. Okay, and there was another question as well. I mean, you've said it's important to try and educate sta um, staff members about the vaccine and the pros and cons and what have you, but that could be a full-time job in itself in terms of researching the, the latest papers and guidance. And um, 
I suppose we must eventually move to a point where what's a trusted source and you know what I mean I wondered if there's any sort of um previous case examples where there are sort of listers lists of you know trusted sources that you can signpost um staff Jim, members to or yeah I, I I haven't looked at this specifically but generally the the, the sort of the gulf dot um pages on on um mm website that give they give advice on all sorts of things um to the department for education the department for health uh those type PHE of PHE and yeah nhs um, direct um yeah exactly nhs direct and of uk are going to be the two um obvious ones to go to yeah um a couple more questions um what are the possible consequences for a business um for withholding pay you know what, what would be the logical yeah. threat from the employee if um, yeah. you were to do okay. that? So the employee, um, firstly, they could issue a claim for unlawful deduction of wages. They could remain in your employment, but sue you for withholding their wages. And then um, you would go to an employment tribunal. Uh, well, you'd probably settle it, but um, <laughs> You, if, if, if you went all the way, you'd go to an employment tribunal, and you would have to argue that that was a lawful deduction, and your defence would be that they weren't willing to attend work, so I was entitled to uh, deduct their wages from them. What is probably more likely to happen if you do really run into an employee who doesn't accept that? And by the way, in my experience, where we've advised um, organisations to do this, most employees have accepted it. Most employees have said, okay, fair enough. It's me that doesn't want to come in. Everyone else is coming in. Um, if you're not going to pay me, that's fair enough. If you do run into those situations where they're refusing to do so, you may well also get a resignation. You may get an employee that resigns and brings a claim for unfair constructive dismissal. That's where uh, the employee is resigning in response to a breach of contract by the employer. They will be arguing that you have breached their contract and you're paying their wages, which entitles them to resign and sue you for unfair dismissal. Again, uh, my view is that you're likely to have a pretty good defence to that claim if you've gone through all of those steps. If you put in those general um, health and safety ones, COVID secure risk assessments, you consult with individual individually and identify extra measures, then I think you should be defending those claims. Okay, and there's one more scenario that somebody's raised is um, what happens if you have a clinically vulnerable member of staff who has been vaccinated, who is attending work, and then you have somebody who doesn't want to come in and, and or he doesn't, doesn't want to have the vaccine, but is happy to come into work. Where do you stand then? Yeah, well, that's where I've said you're in a rock and a hard place. I suppose if the clinically extremely vulnerable individual has had the vaccine, then um, the, 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 they, they should be safe to a certain degree. Um, so it would be more of a concern if you've got someone clinically extremely vulnerable who couldn't have the vaccine because of their condition, perhaps then another individual in their workplace could have the vaccine but was refusing to do so. But this is where, as I say, it gets really interesting and you know the answer because then you've got two individuals <laughs> both not having the vaccine. One, so you have a duty of care to both of them. Uh, duty of care to both, exactly. So all you're going to be able to do in that situation is um, try and introduce measures where you keep, do you know what I mean? You try and keep that person apart. Um, try and um, keep that individual so that there's less contact with, with other people or that person in particular. If you just have those two people, for example, you may be able to come up with a system where they don't come into contact um, with each other. Um, if it was more widespread, it would be more difficult. Um, as I say, if, if anyone has an individual situation like that that they want to discuss with me outside of here, it really will get into the uh, will require getting into the nitty gritty of those situations. Mm. Is is there a um, equivalent case law for? Because I know sort of surgeons and medics have to have had certain tests or jump through you know certain hoops to be safe to practice is is that law transferable into the more general work environment or we 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 will have or to medics see are different. <laughs> yeah we will have to see um 
at the moment because there may be requirements that are introduced in particular sectors, particularly in care and, and, and medicine or, or, or generally where, the, where you're required to have particular vaccinations. At the moment, there is um, no sort of ability for the government to introduce um, a requirement for people to have the vaccination. They would have to change the law to do that. Um, the way the law is structured at the moment, they can make certain, as we saw with lockdown, they can impose certain conditions that aren't yeah. require someone to have a vaccination. Um, you see it with, with measles and that sort of thing. It's up to the individual and it's up to parents to decide whether they want those vaccinations. So that may be something we see further down the line. I don't know. Um, mm. And there's always going to be exceptions. There's going to be people that are sort of, that at, at the moment, pregnant um, ladies are advised not to have it, aren't they? Because they don't know the implications. So we'll, we'll have to see. It's, um, it's going to be a case of watch this space. Yeah. So I had a follow up to um, earlier questions sort of saying that, um, you know, you're still able to um, carry the vaccine, even if you have been vaccinated, which is a good point. Um, and again, studies are still um, looking at to what extent, um, you know, you're more likely to still transmit. But and also um, it, um, one of our delegates is saying employees are not at liberty to confirm if they've had the vaccination. So how can you ensure a safe return to work? Sorry, um, you, well, so you can't. Employees un, don't have to declare whether they've had the vaccine or not. Is that correct? And if so, how do you ensure a safe return to work for other members of the yeah. business? Well, this is this is the sort of GDPR um, question uh, that, that we, the slide that we had at the end. It's 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 going to be difficult to force an employee to tell you. You you can ask employees, um, and if they're willing to volunteer that information. Then it's up to you whether you record it and if you do you update your privacy notice um you that th there's talk of you could try and introduce a requirement into, to people's contracts that they're required to to tell you um and that could certainly be something you can do with all new recruits it's, it is going to be far more difficult with existing employees you would say to an employee i'm requiring for you to tell me whether you've had the vaccination that employee says no and i agree that's going to be very difficult so yeah okay i think that's probably one to sort of continue on a case-by-case -case basis with the with you in person I, I think james as we move forward so um i think that's all the questions that i've had in so far so i mean obviously if anyone has any questions that they that pop into their head once, once we finish then by all means um get in touch with james have you got your contact details on a slide there james or uh, uh, if yeah. not i can share them um, yeah there I we go it's up now but by all means if you want to um share them attendees that would be helpful yeah okay and so i suppose it just um remains for me to say thank you so much james that was really really interesting and it's clearly quite a minefield and it's going to be an issue that's going to rumble on for quite a long time um into the future i imagine so um it's great to know where you are um i'll also just mention that this time next month we've got um Anne, McC Anne mccluskey who will be joining us um from finding true north she's going to be talking um through the some practical tips for self self care and uh, thriving beyond the Corona coaster, which I think we'll all be uh, well in need of by the time we get to April. <laughs> Thanks ever so much for joining us, and we'll see you next month. And thank you, James, again.